All right, now let's take a look at the video. In the portion of the video obtained by ABC News, Attorney Jenna Ellis, who pleaded guilty the day after she did this video interview with the prosecutors, described a conversation that she had at the final Trump White House Christmas party with Dan Scavino, a person who could not possibly have been employed in politics or government by anyone other than Donald Trump. Dan Scavino started working for Donald Trump in a job he was fully qualified for as Donald Trump's golf caddy. Here is the video of that conversation obtained by ABC News. At the time uh, period where they were going to start to discuss what was uh, Dan Scavino's role. At the time, I believe his title was social media director for the White House. It became deputy chief of staff um, at the time that the conversation in question took place. Okay, and when was that? The conversation was around December 19th of 2020 uh, at the White House Christmas party. And I uh, emphasized him, I thought that the, um, the, the claims and the ability to challenge uh, the election results was essentially over because he said um, to me in a kind of excited tone, well, we don't care and we're not going to leave. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, the boss, meaning President Trump and everyone understood the boss. Um, that's what we all called him. Um, he said the boss uh, is not going to leave under any circumstances. We are just going to stay in power. And I said to him, well, it doesn't quite work that way, you realize. And he said, we don't care. Uh, Gwen Keyes, uh, what do the prosecutors make of uh, evidence like that? Well, I think it goes right to their ability to establish the intent to continue the fraud. And that is a key element of every one of the crimes that is listed in the indictment. Uh, that being that the, de the defendants knew they were per perpetrating a lie. Uh, and so this goes right to the heart of that. Uh, Joyce Vance, what about the admissibility of that testimony as we just heard it? There might be other ways for pieces of that testimony to come in, but could we hear it in the trial basically the way we just heard it? You know, I think we could. This involves the application of the hearsay rule. Hearsay is one of those things that gets overly complicated, but it basically is what prosecutors have to do when they've got a statement that was made outside of court that they want to introduce in court for the truth of the matter being discussed in that statement. And one of the big gaping exceptions to the hearsay rule is for co-conspirator testimony. Scavino Lawrence, as you pointed out, had been with Trump for a long time, a confidant, his, his golf caddy. He became the manager of the Westchester Golf Club. He went with Trump to the White House, managed his social media, reportedly wrote his tweets before becoming the deputy chief of staff. And so when he makes this statement to Ellis, I think it's fairly an unindicted co-conspirator's statement in furtherance of the conspiracy, and prosecutors would try to bring it in on that basis. It's problematic. The defense can argue that it's only what Dan Scavino said to Jenna Ellis, and that leaves wide open the question of whether Scavino might not cooperate at some point. He refused to testify in front of the House January 6th committee. The House referred him to DOJ for prosecution, and they took no action, which has always been very interesting, that question as to whether or not Scavino might have cut some sort of a deal. There's simply no strong indication either way in that regard, but he could be a very powerful witness here. Uh, Neil Katyal, the Trump lawyers responded to this particular uh, part uh, of the video that was released, saying uh, that this is absolutely ludicrous because Donald Trump did, in fact, leave the White House on January 20th. Yeah, that's called a non-answer. Um, I think Gwen got it exactly right, Lawrence, in saying this evidence goes to criminal intent, that Donald Trump wasn't thinking about whether he won or lost. He was just going to stay in power no matter what. And near, now you have from quite nearly the horse's mouth saying it, Jenna Ellis, who's not like, you know, Hakeem Jeffries or some lefty. She was as in on all of the coup plots and conspiracy and Trumpista stuff as anyone. And this is where the date is really important, Lawrence. Jenna Ellis said that that conversation with Scavino happened on December 19th. That's after the safe harbor deadline to resolve the state election disputes and certify the election. That was December 8th. 
And it's also after the date that the electors met to cast their vote, which was December 14th. And most importantly, it was after Trump lost in the United States Supreme Court on December 11th, 2020. And you might remember that Jenna Ellis testified before the January 6th committee that at a holiday party, Donald Trump said to Mark Meadows, his chief of staff, I don't want people to know we lost, Mark. It's embarrassing. Figure it out. We need to figure it out. And so all of this together paints a really damaging picture for Donald Trump. I mean, I can't say that I've ever been to any Christmas parties where a topic of conversation is whether a sitting president is going to completely disregard the results of an election. But evidently, that's what happened in the Trump White House. OK, we have more video. And this next piece is video obtained by ABC News of attorney Sidney Powell, who pleaded guilty the day after this video was recorded with prosecutors. Ms. Powell, were you ever around when someone, anyone, told uh, Donald Trump that he had lost the election? Oh, yeah. Who? Uh, Pat Cipollone, Eric Hirschman, Derek Lyons, all thought he'd lost. Was that in the December 18th meeting? Yes. What, what was um, President Trump's reaction when I guess this cadre of advisors would say you lost. It was like, uh, well, they would say that and then they'd walk out and he'd go, see, this is what I deal with all the time. He was specifically willing to appoint me special counsel. In fact, he looked over at Cipollone three different times and said, do I have the authority to name her special counsel? And Cipollone said, yes, you do. And then somebody said, well, she doesn't have a security clearance. So he looked at Cipollone and he said, do I have the authority to give her a security clearance? And Cipollone said, yes, you do. And then about the third time we went through that scenario, uh, Cipollone, I think, said, you can name her anything you want, Mr. President, and nobody's going to pay a bit of attention to it. Neil Katyal, what do you see in that video? Well, I'm the guy who wrote the special counsel regulations, and there's just no way, shape, or form any of that's right. Um, no, you can't have the president appoint the special counsel. That's done through the attorney general, um, who was not Pat Cipollone. But I think what you are seeing there, besides just crazy, crazy legal advice to the president, but is the is really just kind of further evidence that you know Trump was told he lost. He was told he lost. And it's going to really be a devastating thing when this goes to trial and Trump tries to assert that I believed I won because he will look, you know, insane, um, probably not quite enough to get the insanity defense going, but certainly not um, something that's going to be credible before a jury. Uh, Gwen Key says Sidney Powell seems to say, seems to tell the prosecutors that she believed that Donald Trump believed that he won. Well, again, I think that's where uh, the jury is going to be able to assess witness credibility. Uh, what Ms. Powell or who Ms. Powell listed on that tape in terms of the individuals that told the president that he had not won, that is a very long list, which again includes the former attorney general, the head of uh, CISA, the, the Cyber Infrastructure Security administration. Uh, it includes several officials at DOJ. And so the list is getting longer and longer, and it is backed up by Ms. Powell's testimony the number of times the president was told that he did not win the election. Uh, and as Neil pointed out, all of this came at a critical point in time when all of the legal avenues to remain in office were closed. And the only thing on his mind after all of the legal options, uh, seemingly on his mind after all of the legal options were, were closed, was to continue to stay in office. And so that's the argument I anticipate D.A. Willis and her team will make uh, to, to support the charges that she's brought. All right. The Washington Post is saying they have seen uh, some of all of the video of all of the uh, co-defendants who've pleaded uh, guilty. And they are reporting details of attorney Kenneth Shisbro's interview with prosecutors the very same day that he pleaded guilty. Washington Post says Shisbro disclosed in his recorded statement that at a previously unreported White House meeting, he briefed Trump on election challenges in Arizona and summarized a memo in which he offered advice on assembling alternate slates of electors in key battlegrounds to cast ballots for Trump, despite Biden's victories in those states. 
Chesbro also disclosed for the first time that he played a role transporting documents signed by Wisconsin Trump electors to Capitol mm -hmm. Hill as part of a Trump campaign plan to present Vice President Pence with competing slates of electors. And Joyce Vance, uh, those Wisconsin electors and how they got to Washington has been a part of this story from the start. That's absolutely right. And Lawrence, this reporting is interesting because it underscores the point that you originally made and that Neil discussed, that what we know about are these snippets of testimony from the proffers that has been released. There's obviously a lot more, and prosecutors believe that they had good reasons for making these sweetheart plea deals with these folks. We begin to see some of that here. The story of the fate slates of electors is critical. Chesbro is a big player in that, along with John Eastman. And so going through the mechanics of how those parts of the scheme were executed and who was involved is potentially some of the most devastating testimony that Willis can present. It sounds like she knows a lot more now than she knew even at the point where she indicted. And Gwen Keyes, we also learn in the Washington Post reporting that Scott Hall, uh, the bail bondsman who has uh, pleaded guilty, told prosecutors in his video interview that he helped track down a Fulton County election worker, Ruby Freeman, so that she could then be harassed by other Trump co-defendants. Uh, Gwen, that's information that we did not know before. That is true. And again, let's remember, if you look at the overall indictment, you can break it down into at least four different subparts. You've got uh, the fraud against the legislatures lying to elected officials. You have the Coffee County matter. You have the fake electors matter. And you have the allegations of intimidation against Ms. Freeman. And so all of these pleas and now the proffers and anticipated testimony from the pleas will all help the DA establish the various elements of the crimes that outline those four or five major themes within the indictment.